Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me to talk, putting the paper on the program. So this is uh, joint with Kelly Shu, uh, who's also at Booth. Um, and it's a paper about contrast effects in financial markets. So uh, I'm guessing we all know the financial markets part of this title. Let's start by talking a little bit about what uh, a contrast effect is. So um, a contrast effect is a very old finding from psychology. And the basic idea is the value of something that you just recently saw inversely impacts how you currently see something. So this has been shown kind of quite cleanly in the, uh, the psych laboratory. So if you ask people to kind of judge the seriousness of crimes, kind of give them a crime, say how bad was it, show them another crime, if you show them a really um, uh, egregious crime, well, the next crime that they view they're going to rate is slightly less serious than they would otherwise. Similarly, give them something really benign, the next crime is going to seem more serious than it would otherwise. Um, this has also been shown if you ask um, students to rate kind of the attractiveness uh, of female classmates, if you first show them a picture of a model or an actress, they're going to view the next picture is less attractive than they would otherwise. So this has been shown uh, you know, in these settings and a variety of other settings in the, the psychology laboratory. It's also at least anecdotally ubiquitous in kind of popular culture. So if you're you know, in a rock band, you don't want to go on stage after a really good rock band. They're a tough act to follow. You might pale in comparison. Um, to uh, the, the band that, that kind of preceded you. If you're an author, you use this to your advantage. You manipulate the reader. If you've got a character with a certain trait that you want to highlight, you put in another character with the opposite trait. That foil kind of heightens your awareness of the difference. And then finally, of course, there's the urban legend. If you want to go out to a bar and appear even more attractive, bringing along an ugly friend might make you look even hotter. So um, we know contrast effects are important in the psych laboratory. We know they're important in popular culture. Um, they're also kind of how we view the world. So if you think about how we perceive things, so there's kind of two semicircles here. Do we all agree the one on the right appears slightly darker than the one on the left? Um, so this would be very boring if that was the case. They are, in fact, the exact same shade. So what's going on here? Well, this is a contrast effect. The, the circle on the right is against a relatively lighter background. That makes it, in contrast, appears darker. The one on the left is against a darker background. In contrast, that makes it appear lighter. So even though you know that these things are actually the exact same shade of gray now, just how your, your mind functions, how you perceive uh, these two circles still is a different shade. That's how we kind of uh, view the world. One more example of perception. So this is um, Yao Ming and Shaquille O'Neal, uh, two ex-basketball players, two uh, humongous human beings. Um, and is, I think most people know Shaq in particular is quite large, but standing next to Yao Ming, he looks a little bit shorter. So he still looks like a very big man. He is a very big man, but he looks a bit shorter than he would otherwise. Now, if you put someone kind of a bit more normal size, this is now Allen Iverson and Yao Ming. So Allen Iverson's about my height, um, and I typically don't perceive, like, am not perceived as very, very small. But Allen Iverson looks pretty small next to Yao. So this is another visual contrast effect. Everyone looks a little bit shorter standing next to someone who's extremely tall. OK, so we know it exists in the psych laboratory. We know it's in pop culture. We know it's kind of visually how our brain um, looks at signals. What about the real world? What about kind of economic settings that we typically think are um, important? And the short answer is we don't quite know. I can tell many stories that are consistent with their importance, kind of any important decision you make in a sequence. So hiring and promotion decisions. If you're making investment decisions, maybe you invest in a bad project because you just saw some really bad projects. Maybe you skip a good one because you just saw some really good ones. Judicial decisions, household consumption, mate choice, real estate decisions. All of these um, are scenarios where contrast effects could be important, but it's going to be very hard to identify. 
Um, first off, it's going to be hard to really measure information. It's going to be hard to measure how that information is perceived. Um, and it's going to be hard to tease contrast effects apart from other important real world constraints, such as quotas, resource constraints, things along those lines. So we know that contrast effects are important in a number of settings, but there's fairly limited evidence in the field. And that evidence is limited to basically individuals making kind of infrequent decisions. So probably the cleanest evidence actually comes from speed dating. Um, and there's also evidence consistent with contrast effects in housing choice, but there isn't very much real world evidence. So that's where this paper is going to come in. So we're going to ask, do these contrast effects matter for prices in financial markets? And we think this is a nice contribution because relative to kind of the laboratory settings or these, this little bit of field evidence, we're going to be looking at you know, prices set by full-time professionals uh, who are making repeated decisions with high stakes. Uh, and of course, we're looking at prices. This is an equilibrium outcome. So even if they're just a few investors who say exhibit contrast effects, maybe they aren't relevant for setting prices. But if contrast effects do impact financial markets, we think this is particularly interesting because it means that prices are reacting not just um, to the absolute content of news, but also to this relative content um, in a biased manner. So that's what we're going to look for. And we're going to look for it in the price reaction to quarterly earnings announcements. And we think this is actually a fairly ideal laboratory to, uh, to be uh, examining the impact of contrast effects. So first off, quarterly earnings news, big, important, salient events. Um, so that, that's a, a very uh, you know, important aspect to kind of reaction to any sort of news. And the second bit is we think it's plausible that people are paying attention to a very similar sequence of events. Um, we're going to be focusing on kind of large firms, and so it makes sense that kind of everyone is reading the Wall Street Journal, everyone's paying attention to these firms. The next um, part that's going to be important to us is that these announcements are typically scheduled a couple of weeks before they actually occur. So what that means is whether a firm is announcing before or after, say, um, positive or negative surprises the previous day is roughly uncorrelated with any firm fundamental. Finally, we have the data to measure this. So we, kind of, we know, uh, have a measure of what perceptions of announcements are. We have analyst forecasts. We have a perception of, or we have a measure of what the, it actually were. We see what the earnings when they were announced. And we kind of have a measure of how people reacted to it, how they felt about the signal, the price response. So we have all the relevant data to look at it. Finally, we've got a pretty clean hypothesis. So what do contrast effects imply in terms of reactions to earnings announcements? Well, basically, there should be an inverse relation between the return today and the news that was kind of big and important yesterday. All else equal. So this is you will have a muted response to whatever the earnings were conditional on that earnings. What this means is if yesterday there was really good news, well today when you announce earnings you would expect the return response to be slightly lower than it would have been otherwise conditional on the level of earnings you announced. If yesterday there was really bad news, you'll expect the returns to be slightly higher. So that's what we're going to look for, and that's basically what we're going to find. So what I've graphed here on the x-axis is our measure of kind of the attention-grabbing surprise yesterday. We're going to talk about how we constructed, think about just the really big firms that announced yesterday. The left side of the axis is there was negative earnings surprise. The right side is their positive earnings surprise. The y-axis is the return response to um, earnings today conditional on the level of earnings that you actually announced. So we're taking out um, the impact of the level that you announced. And so what you can see is when you look at the residual, um, when yesterday's news was bad, returns all else equal are higher. That's the top left corner. When yesterday's news was really good, today all else equal, the return response is positive. That's that bottom right corner. And it's kind of pretty consistent across the whole support uh, of surprises that happened yesterday. So that's the main finding of the paper, um, and that's more or less what we're going to explore. 
So we're gonna try to show that contrast effects have a predictable impact on price reactions to earnings announcements. The effect's pretty sizable, so if you go from the average in the lowest decile of surprise yesterday to the average in the highest, it's about a, a 50 basis point swing. And later in the paper, we're gonna form some portfolios and try to look at kind of what the daily alphas of that um, would add up to, and we get decent returns of about seven to 15% per year. Um, in terms of asset pricing anomalies, everything we're gonna be looking at, or sorry, almost everything, is really gonna be looking at large firms compared to other large firms. That's where most of our action is, and it also has been present in our whole sample, but especially in kind of the more recent years. Further evidence of contrast effects consistent with what's found in the lab, we find that if you go further back in time, so not yesterday, but two days ago, three days ago, or into the future, you really don't see much of an effect. Um, and for the, the sample of our data that we have timestamps, we can show that within the same day there appear to be contrasts where firms that announce in the afternoon exhibit a contrast uh, effect with firms in the morning, but not really vice versa. Finally, contrast effects are a bias. As such, you would expect to see this bias reverse over time. Um, and while it's a bit noisier, we do find evidence consistent with this reversal. So, that's kind of the evidence for contrast effects. I'm sure at this point that you have many alternative explanations floating around in your mind. Um, and we'll spend a bunch of time talking about those. But the one that I want to kind of stress at the beginning is some sort of information story, because this seems to be the most plausible. Yesterday, a firm announced this transmitted some information which changed the appropriate return response. Um, and just to kind of talk about a couple of things, we're using cumulative returns that start before the previous day firms announced, which is going to rule out any kind of positive correlation in news. And then finally, we can say, well, what did the market um, uh, we say, did it react yesterday? No, it really didn't. And also yesterday's surprise has basically no predictive power for today's surprise. So we'll talk about those uh, a bunch more in depth in a few minutes. But so we're gonna talk about the methodology, some results, get to those alternative explanations, some trading strategies, and if I have time, some heterogeneity uh, and robustness. So uh, empirically, this is a pretty simple paper. We're basically gonna be looking at kind of IBIS forecasts, uh, crisp returns. First thing we need is a measure of the earnings surprise. We're just going to take um, basically an actual earnings, subtract off a consensus forecast measure, scale by price. Um, in the paper, we explore a bunch of variations of, them, uh, of this measure. It's not especially important. The thing that's slightly non-standard is so we want this measure of what kind of the attention-grabbing earnings was yesterday. What are the salient firms? The main proxy we're going to examine in this regard is size. So we're gonna look at um, only firms above the 90th percentile of NYSE market cap, and in our baseline specification, we're just gonna evaluate those surprises. Now, if you don't like analyst forecasts, um, you can do most of our analysis just on return-based measures instead of analyst surprise-based measures, find very similar results. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna ask, how are the returns to an announcement day on day T? I'm gonna refer to today as day T, yesterday as T minus one, but this is in kind of trading day time. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna regress the returns from firms that announced today. We're gonna do this returns on the left-hand side is kind of a three-day window. So from market close T minus two to market close T plus one. Um, everything we're going to be looking at are characteristic adjusted returns. These are returns matched by quintile of size, book to market, and momentum. Um, and one little wrinkle we're doing is we're excluding any firm that announced earnings today or that is included in the surprise T minus one measure um, from the, the matched portfolio, but it actually doesn't make much of a difference. So that's our return measure. We're gonna regress this on our, our measure of the salient surprises yesterday, that surprise T minus one. And that beta one coefficient is the, the coefficient of interest, what I'm gonna be reporting in most of the regressions. And the prediction is this should be negative. The next um, variable is you need to control for own surprise bin. So this is uh, basically a non-parametric control for the level of earnings surprise you actually announced. Because recall, contrast effects are about being slightly higher or lower than you would have been otherwise. If you announce good news, you're gonna have a positive return. This is how big or how, how small that positive return is. Then we're gonna throw in some year-month fixed effects to make sure we just aren't capturing some, some sort of a time trend. 
Um, these regressions are going to be value weighted, so it's really focused on the large firms. And if we get to the robustness, I'll, I'll show you that really all of the action is coming from, say, the top quintile or so of market cap. So that's what we're going to look for. Um, and this is what we're going to find. So this um, table is showing you this beta 1 coefficient, kind of six different versions. The first two looks at just the largest firm to announce yesterday. You'll see negative and significant coefficients. Three and four is the measure I showed you, but equal weighted rather than value weighted. Five and six um, is basically the regression that I told you where column six has the year month fixed effects. And so you can see that that's negative um, significant. Uh, it's about negative 0.9, highly statistically significant. Um, it, so is it meaningful? It's hard to know um, without kind of uh, in interpreting in that in some way. So one way you could think about this is, so what's the, uh, lo the average in the lowest decile of surprise yesterday? What's the average in the highest? Moving from that low to high is about a 50 basis point swing in returns. If you'd rather think in terms of, say, standard deviations, a one standard deviation shift in surprise T minus one is about a 15 basis point uh, different in, difference in returns. So that's the baseline measure, and I think you can see that that's, this graph is the analog of that. It shows you the strong negative relation between yesterday's surprise and today. This is just a local linear plot as opposed to a regression model. So another way that you can think about contrast effects is that it's a difference in the price reaction to the level of earnings that you actually announce. So what I've graphed here is instead of yesterday's surprise on the x-axis, your own announced surprise on the x-axis. And then it's still going to be the return reaction to that announcement on the y-axis. So first thing to note, you announce better news, you get higher returns, kind of no matter how you cut the data. Uh, I think this is very good, a, a nice kind of sanity check. Um, but I've graphed two lines here, so they're, they're fairly parallel. In the red line on the top, is just the sample where yesterday's news was particularly bad, the lowest decile of news. And the blue line is when yesterday's news was particularly good, the highest decile of news. And what you can see is basically across the entire support of earnings surprise that a firm announced, the contrast seems to shift um, return reactions slightly higher when yesterday's news was bad, slightly lower when yesterday's news was good, and kind of similar to Yao Ming making everyone look shorter. If you announced really good news after a good day, you're a bit lower, even though it's positive. If you announce good news after, uh, or sorry, bad news after a really good day, it's a negative return, but it's still going to be um, shifted based on what you saw the previous day. So. Uh, another thing that, that might be going on that we wanted to test for is, is it this simple kind of parallel shift in contrast effects, or is there a slightly more complex say, interaction story going on? So what we're looking for here is, is there an interaction in this relation between the surprise yesterday and the surprise today that leads to a differential return response? The top line is just our basic kind of level effect. What was that beta 1 coefficient before? And what you can see is it, it's roughly the same. When you put in all of these different interactions, there's not a bunch of action going on. And then columns 1 through 3 just put kind of a whole battery of possible interaction coefficients in there, whether it's linear terms, dummy variables. Um, and we don't find much evidence for it. So we don't claim to rule it out. But the, the strongest effect seems to be the simple kind of parallel shift in contrast effects that is consistent with uh, what we find in kind of the lab literature from psychology. Uh, so uh, another thing we can look at is everything so far has been the bi surprise by big firms yesterday and the return response today. Um, so that's consistent with what we find in the lab. So for example, in speed dating, men exhibit contrast effects with the woman they saw the previous round, but that dies off quite quickly. It's not true for women two rounds ago, three rounds ago, not true with um, women in the future. And so we're going to look um, and see if that's the case here. So we're just going to go back two, minus two, two days ago, three days ago, also into the future. Uh, one note here, we're going to extend the return windows to make sure we could capture the effect uh, if it exists elsewhere in the, the window to make sure we're capturing the whole period. Um, and so this is what we're going to find. Column one is kind of going back into the past. Column two is going forward into the future. First thing to note is that what happened yesterday is still where the action is. This is negative, significant, basically the same size. Uh, at least controlling for these kind of further lags and leads had no impact on our measure of contrast effects. 
Um, you look into the past, it's kind of weak and inconsistent. Th those coefficients are basically zero. If you look into the future, basically weak and inconsistent, uh, it, it basically zero. This seems to be that these firms are exhibiting a contrast effect with respect to what happened yesterday, not two days ago, not three days ago, not into the future, again, consistent with the lab evidence on contrast effects. So, for some of our data, we have um, timestamps. We know when in the day these firms announced. Uh, in general, these firms announce either a bit before market open, we're gonna call those morning announcers, a bit after market close, we're gonna call those afternoon announcers. Um, we also aren't sure how much discretion firms have on this timing, so we don't know if we have quite the cleanliness we had in the, uh, the pre-scheduling of the date. So this is kind of what we view as a, a supplementary analysis. Um, and the prediction here is that if you're announcing in the afternoon, um, you should probably be exhibiting the contrast effect with the earnings surprise that happened the same day that morning. So that's what we're gonna look for, and again, that's what we're gonna find. So in column one, we're regressing the return reaction to afternoon announcers on large firms earning surprise that morning. Um, and again, we're gonna find a negative and significant coefficient. If anything, if anything, things are slightly stronger when we look at this within day rather than the across day effect. And then if you regress, well, what about the returns um, of firms that announce in the morning on the uh, earnings surprise of the, of the afternoon? So afterwards, we don't see a contrast effect. Um, which, uh, again, is not surprising given the kind of sequential effects we're seeing uh, in the lab and across days. Um, so finally, uh, let's talk about some long-run reversals. So contrast effects are bias in information processing. If prices are being uh, impacted by a bias, eventually you'd expect them to revert back to fundamentals. So what we're gonna do here is the first row, we're just gonna extend the return window that we're looking at from T plus one further and further out into time. In the second row, we're gonna start after um, the initial return window and extend further out in time. So you'd expect the top row to eventually go back to zero. In the bottom row, we wanna see a positive and significant um, reversal, a and that's what we're gonna see. You go out about two months, um, and the, the coefficient on surprise T minus one is about zero. Um, the, the coefficient uh, on the window that starts after it becomes uh, positive, but this is a noisy process looking at this kind of uh, return window. Okay, so that is kind of the evidence uh, we have that's for contrast effects. Now I wanna talk about a bunch of alternative explanations. So everything I've shown you is consistent with kind of the classic lab findings on contrast, but that doesn't mean that there aren't kind of important alternatives that could be going on. So I wanna talk about a few of these. First and foremost, I wanna talk about information transmission, because I think this is probably the most plausible story. Yesterday, a large firm announces news, that uh, news in some way impacts my share price, and so the return that I'm measuring in terms of an earnings announcement has that information along with the earnings announcement. So to talk through this, let's just use a simple example. So let's say firm A announced yesterday, T minus one, they announced good news, a positive surprise. Today, firm B is announcing at time T, empirically we say that their return reaction is all else equal negative. Can information transmission explain this low return for B? Um, so the first thing we wanna talk about is there, is there some sort of positive correlation in news? So A's good news yesterday was good news for firm B today. We think this is probably most people's priors. The accounting literature that's looked at, say, earnings surprises is focused on bellwether term, or firms, positive correlations in news. Um, and so the important thing in ruling out this story is the return window that we're looking at. Again, when we're looking at Firm B's returns, we're starting from before Firm A announces. So we have both Firm A's announcement and Firm B's. So what does this mean for Firm B? Well, if Firm A announces good news, maybe you have a higher return at T minus one, maybe you have a lower return at T, where returns happen can be shifted around. But since we're looking at this cumulative return, you can't have the cumulative of return to firm B be negative if there's good news released by firm A. So it can't be that there is a positive correlation um, in news from firm A's good news to firm B to explain our results. So what about a negative correlation in news? So yesterday firm A announced good news. This is bad news for firm B today. 
So the first thing we can say is, well, is this predictive of earnings surprises? So it could just be news about earnings surprises that shifts around expectations. If so, you would expect that firm A's announcement to negatively predict firm B, and we don't see that. So if you just look at kind of the, the basic regression of the surprise yesterday, or sorry, the surprise today on the surprise yesterday, with no controls, you find a positive significant coefficient. It's going the wrong way. After you control for some slow-moving effects and you know, some quarters just have better news than others, it's basically zero. So there's almost no predictive power for yesterday's earnings surprise for today, so it can't be just news about the earnings surprise. But what about negatively correlated news that isn't specifically about the earnings surprise? Well, so now we can say, did the market behave as if this was the case? So when A announced their news, we would expect firm B's price to move on that announcement at T minus one. And we don't see that. So if you look at firm B's response to firm A's announcement yesterday, there's no movement in the market. There's no action going on there. So it can't be that the market is rationally responding to bad news from firm A. One other possibility, maybe we're just kind of looking at some subsamples where this is true, some subsamples where it isn't, and these subsamples are kind of driving our results. So in this slide, what I've done is basically limit the sample to where we don't think contrast effects should be there. So the first two columns are um, w examples where Firm B didn't move in response to Firm A's announcements. Their kind of characteristic adjusted return was quite low. So we find a big contrast effects there, uh, which is again not consistent with kind of a rational uh, information story. And then in column three, we've limited to a subsample where there's no negative correlation in info information transmission from the market. So if Firm A announced good news yesterday, we're only gonna look at examples where firm B had positive returns yesterday. Um, so we're only gonna look for positive, not negative correlations. And again, we're gonna find negative significant contrast effects. It doesn't appear that we were kind of missing a subgroup. Um, what about a delayed response? So now we're moving out of kind of standard rational theories into more behavioral theories. But the idea here is, a announced bad news yesterday, but for whatever reason, the market just didn't pay attention to firm B yesterday. They're waiting until firm B announces earnings the next day to respond. Um, so we can't directly get at that necessarily, but it seems like if, the fir if firm B was being ignored yesterday, well, why not two days ago? Why not three days ago? Um, and then finally, if information is being transmitted, we shouldn't see this long run reversal, uh, which we find evidence of in the data. So we can't rule out all information transmission stories. I want to be, be upfront about that. But kind of what we're left with, given the data, is the following. Uh, any information story needs to be that A's T minus 1 positive surprise has negative information for B. This information relates to B's prospects other than just B's earnings, because there's no predictability there. Rational investors shouldn't wait until day T to react, but these guys do. When they do react, they react in a biased manner. This leads to a long-run reversal. And this information that they're reacting to in a delayed manner is only released at T minus two, T minus three, not T minus one. So we think that our explanation is more parsimonious, but again, we can't rule out uh, this information story. So one of the things that we think is particularly cool with kind of the, the timing of uh, the results that we have is we can disentangle two different classes of behavioral biases. So in finance, typically when we think about biases, we're thinking about expectational errors. So there's some sort of information and in you, you either are too optimistic, too pessimistic, you extrapolate, you exhibit something like the gambler's fallacy. Um, but in, in this case, that predicts that, price, that B's price should change at T minus one. Your expectations updated in the wrong way. When they updated, the price should change. So instead, we think this is an example of what we'll call a perceptual bias. So basically, it's not that your expectations are wrong, it's how you interpret the current signal is biased by the previous signal. And so this is a class of, of errors that has gotten a lot of attention kind of in other realms of psychology, not as much in finance, but we think it's nice to kind of show that these perceptual biases are important in a financial setting um, as well too. So a, a few more kind of possibilities we want to talk about. One is strategic manipulation, either um, of the timing of the announcement 
or maybe you're um, in some way changing your earnings number. We, we think this is unlikely in that we're talking about changing numbers uh, based on the surprise yesterday. Um, and also we think it's unlikely that timing is important because you need to know what the earnings surprise will be kind of a couple of weeks uh, in, in advance. Now we can test for this explicitly. We're just gonna look at firms that seem to be announcing in the normal course of business that haven't shifted their announcement date very much. And we're gonna find that that's where the action is. So it seems to be firms that are kind of announcing on their, their normal schedule that exhibit the contrast effects. So it doesn't seem to be that they're kind of strategically manipulating their date based on yesterday's surprise. Um, another possible story, changes in risk, changes in trading frictions. Um, so everything I've shown you is using kind of characteristic adjusted returns is a, a, a risk adjustment. So what we would need is some sort of kind of differential loadings on betas on these days and standard, uh, on kind of standard risk factors. In the paper, we do some tests uh, that look at this. We don't find any evidence consistent of it. Uh, is it tail risk, illiquidity, volatility? Um, again, in the paper, we look at these and we don't find much evidence consistent with it. Um, another story we've gotten is some sort of limited capital story. So yesterday's news was really good. And so everyone, say, buys that stock and there's just not enough capital to buy things the next day. Um, and again, we don't find much evidence of this. We don't see much action with volume. Um, we don't see low returns for non-announcing firms. And also we see this slow price correction. So if it's that you've tied up capital in a short window, uh, we'd expect it to occur slowly. And also we're looking at very large stocks. So, you know, top decile or so, top quintile of stocks, uh, that story seems less likely as well too. So also this is just showing you that kind of the, the shift in the distribution of returns is really happening towards the means. It isn't being driven by kind of tails. Um, okay, so well now let's look at kind of an unconditional result in a trading strategy. So first off, as I showed you in kind of those upward sloping graphs, clearly your own um, announced earnings amount is probably the first order most important thing going on and returns respond to it. Now, that being said, I also showed you that yesterday's surprise and today's surprise are roughly uncorrelated. So what, and that the action is really coming on my announcement at day T. So what that means is I can now stop controlling for the own announced surprise. This is gonna add more noise to the regression. This is gonna attenuate some coefficients, but now I don't have a look ahead bias anymore. So if I do that um, and do basically the exact same uh, chart as before, but now I've taken out any of the, uh, the look aheads, these are open to open returns, just starting at day T without controlling for the year month fixed effects or my own announced surprise, what you'll see is a very similar picture. It's not quite as steep, the standard error bars have increased, but you get a lot of this without controlling for your own announcement because they're kind of uncorrelated variables. So another way you can look at this um, is just kind of look at the average cumulative characteristic adjusted returns for firms where there was really bad news yesterday and really good news yesterday. The red line is basically you were below the 25th percentile of surprise yesterday. This is based on the previous quarter's distribution of surprise. Um, the blue line uh, is again, you're after really good news. So you can see that you get positive returns after the bad news, negative returns after the good news. And this is unconditional not controlling um, for any variable that has a look ahead to it. So another thing we can do along these lines is we can form a trading strategy and do kind of a classic Fama French type regression. Um, so we view this as just another way of showing that kind of our, our characteristic adjustments weren't um, faulty. This is a different way of risk adjusting, uh, but it's gonna give you uh, very similar results. Our strategy is gonna be simple. On days that uh, surprise T minus one was low, we're gonna go long firms announcing today, short the market. Um, on days where yesterday's the news was really good, we're gonna go long the market, short firms announcing today. Um, we're only gonna trade the top quintile of size and we're gonna hold this portfolio at T and T plus one. And then we're just gonna run regressions. These are gonna be daily Fama French regressions. We're gonna look at uh, the market, SMB, HML, and uh, momentum. So what do we get here? Uh, so basically the top row is the alphas. So you can see that we're getting daily alphas of between about nine and 21 basis points. Um, column one is where we're splitting on just 
Did you have a positive or negative surprise by big firms yesterday? Columns two and four are splitting closer to that characteristic adjusted return graph. Were you below the 25th percentile yesterday or above the 75th? You take more extreme cuts, you get higher alphas. Um, and so these are quite large. Something that's important here, you can't implement this every day. You can only implement this on days where there are earnings announcements today. Yesterday, large firms announced um, with the characteristics that we need to form these portfolios. Um, and so if you kind of take that into account and do this over the course of a year, on average, this was giving us about 7 to, seven to 15% abnormal returns Again, not accounting for fees or anything that's, that's important in the real world, um, but this is what we're getting from, from that model. Uh, okay, so let me talk a little bit about a couple of other results from the paper. Um, first off, where is this action coming from? So all the regressions I've shown you so far are valuated. So those are basically emphasizing the large firms. Um, and so the first column here, I've just split by quintile uh, of firms. And what you can see is all the actions coming from big firms. And we think that's because big firms are a bit more homogenous and that people are paying attention to the same sequence of announcements, which means that's where we'd expect the bias to be. Though you can see kind of through the whole distribution, most of the coefficients are negative, just not, not significant. A related measure is analyst coverage. Uh, so if you look, uh, look at the second column, you can see that basically all of our action is coming from firms with significant analyst coverage. The small firms with just one analyst, there, there's not much action on that variable. Uh, so another thing we can look at is over time. How has this gone? So we've just split by decades separately, do it in the 80s, the 90s, 2000s, 2010s. And, and what you see again is the strongest effect has been uh, kind of since 2000. Um, so 2000 to 2010 and 2010 till today, those are where kind of a lot of the power and significance is coming from. Some of this truthfully could be data. So the, the data before 2000 um, has some issues in, in terms of timing, but the later, the later sample is the, the kind of the better data, and so we find the, the stronger effect. Last thing could be day of the week. Um, it, so you could think contrast effects might get, so we're gonna look at kind of Mondays versus Fridays. The idea here is um, on Mondays you had the weekend in between. So one story is, well there was announcements Friday, over the weekend you kind of pay less attention to them. Um, so on Mondays you'd expect there to be less of a contrast effect. Now you could have the flip story of, you know, there was an announcement Friday, you spend the whole weekend thinking about this earnings announcement um, and get a stronger effect on Monday. Both are possible. Um, in the data, uh, the effect seems weaker on Mondays. Uh, so you can see the, the coefficients in columns one and three are, are uh, basically small and insignificant versus the other days of the week, that's where the action's coming from. Something we do wanna emphasize though is that this is a noisy estimate. Um, so even though the Mondays uh, are not statistically different from zero, they also aren't statistically different from the other days of the week. Um, but there seems to be much less of an effect uh, in these regressions, at least if you, if you buy the point estimates. One final thing, everything we've looked at is large firm to large firm. That's the comparison we're looking at. And we aren't looking at that because we think that contrast effects aren't important for small firms, but we think there's a lot more heterogeneity and it's a lot harder for us to capture what kind of the appropriate um, like reference uh, announcement is for these firms. So to try to make one step in that direction, we're gonna look at how this varies across industries. So the first column, what I've done is created two surprise variables from the previous day. A surprise that's the same industry as you and a surprise for the different industry. And what you see is if you do it, the whole sample evaluated, you find very similar results in same industry and different industry. Now, if you look at an equal weighted version of this regression, so bring in small firms a lot more, it's basically only happening within the same industry. So we find a negative and significant coefficient for firms in the same industry, not across different industries. So we think that this kind of makes sense and that small firm investors are probably paying more attention to industry specific news. Now, the final um, column that we've done in, in three here is we're back to evaluating, so back to looking at big firms, but now what we're gonna do is include only days where yesterday there was a same industry firm 
and there was a different industry firm. So on those days where you basically have a choice as to whether to pay attention to the same industry or they're different, you find a much larger effect uh, for the same industry, though again, different industry is significant and not statistically different um, than that same industry effect. So it appears that contrast effects across size are important, across industry are important, especially for small firms, uh, but to some degree the large firms too. So that's basically the paper. Um, I hope uh, I've shown you that kind of contrast effects are robust outside the lab um, in, in a pretty cool setting to test for behavioral um, biases. This is market prices, professionals, high stakes. Um, in terms of the underlying psychology of this, we think that this is a nice um, basis for some preferences that are popular in, say, macro finance, in macroeconomics, such as related to internal habits, where you're valuing consumption relative to kind of previous experience. So clearly those are, are preferences, not a bias, but it seems like this is a bit of a micro foundation there. Also, we think that it's very cool that we can disentangle this as an error in perceptions rather than an error in expectations. And then finally, we picked a setting where firms have very little scope to manipulate. So this is pre-scheduled. You don't know what the earnings surprise is going to be the previous day when you set this date. But you can think of a variety of scenarios where firms have scope to take advantage of this bias and may well do so. For example, releasing bad news, waiting till someone else did it so you can release after them so you don't look um, as bad in comparison. Thanks. Title of this paper is a tough act to follow, and I feel that's appropriate for the title of this discussion because many of you probably don't know this, but I Googled around, and he just won the first prize for the AQR Inside Award, which is 100 grand. And he was competing against a little known hole in the wall guy from Stanford called Daryl Duffy. Um, so this is a good paper, right? So I'm not gonna talk about how we can improve the regression, how we can do another 30 robustness tests to try to ferret this out. I believe in the results. Uh, I think it's well done. What I'm gonna talk about is how applicable this finding might be out of sample. So, kind of two key takeaways. The first one here that uh, Sam mentioned is that these contrast effects, kind of remarkably, actually distort marker reactions. So depending on how the surprise happened the day prior, that'll affect how a firm will be influenced the following day and over the whole time period, where following poor surprises, you get bigger reactions. Following high surprises, you get lower reactions. And it seems to be a general effect across the spectrum of when a firm itself announces, whether it's positive or negative. And maybe you could argue in the extremes it may not be as applicable. At least statistically, it's hard to distinguish that. Uh, two reasons for that, maybe one, just the data is more noisy, or two, perhaps the saliency of a really, really extreme surprise may dwarf or minimize the effect of contrast. Who knows, but it's interesting. Kind of the more surprising thing, to me at least, is that a pretty basic trading strategy seems to generate a pretty good return. I think Sam says anywhere from 7 to 15% a year. Uh, everyone would love to do that, especially our friend at Point72 who presented uh, earlier. And what you see here is on this top chart, by simply owning for the whole basket of announcers following a, high or a low surprise, they tend to have a positive carry. Whereas on this bottom chart here, if you simply hold a basket of announcers following a high surprise, they tend to have negative carry. So doing a very basic trading strategy seems to make a lot of money. All right. I'm always skeptical of that um, because traditionally when I think about behavioral finance papers, I like to think through the behavioral finance framework where it typically involves two components. One, understand the behavioral bias. And this paper does an outstanding job of doing that. And it identifies that contrast effects clearly seem to be influencing and dislodging prices from their quote-unquote fundamental or market efficient level. But what you don't see in this paper, or it's kind of cursorily discussed, is what are the limits to arbitrage? Where are all the smart poker players, and why haven't they taken some leveraged capital and already exploited this? 
Like, is there a schleifer vishni problem where there's a principal agent issue? Is it short rebates? Is it trading frictions? Who knows? Uh, there's not really a discussion about this. So, what, and, and from thinking about how the trading strategy works, and because it's in very big, deep, liquid stocks, it made me think that Sam, you know, maybe would have been better served maybe telling Chris about this as, as, you know, so he could have a quant go exploit it as maybe as opposed to you know, telling AQR about how this all works. So I think that the sustainability of this particular strategy is just not sustainable. It doesn't seem to me that there's clear arbitrage constraints out there, uh, as you typically see in a lot of other you know, wacky strategies like a value or momentum or what have you. It also feels like you know, someone at 0.72 or Millennium could take a little bit of leverage capital, throw it to one of their quant groups, because this strategy just doesn't seem to be correlated with any other strategy. So if you pulled it with 100 others, you could probably capture the alpha and not have to deal with the random idiosyncratic noise. <clears throat> the other thing is, I was at a conference a few months ago, and just in ta talking about fintech stuff, and a firm Estimize, uh, they do crowdsource earnings announcements, and I haven't verified their data, but just taking the guy's you know, data at face value, it seems to do a much better job at predicting earnings. And now they sell this data to hedge funds and what have you. So I just feel like earnings announcements and understanding forecast, it's getting a lot better. So when you combine no arbitrage constraints, no kind of obvious correlations with other you know, typical strategies that are out there, and the fact that technology is getting better, I think it's unlikely this is a sustainable sort of strategy. So how this matters for asset pricing out of sample is a little bit less clear to me. Um, but that said, I think the fact that Sam has identified specifically how behavioral bias has influenced market reactions and prices and, and had them deviate from fundamentals is interesting in itself. Uh, it's a very nice paper. Um, but again, I think in 10 years when McLean and Pontiff republish an update on their paper about you know, when people publish papers, the alpha decays, I think this will probably be a great case study, an example of that very phenomenon. So pretty quick, uh, that's all I have, and uh, thank you for the invitation. So thanks to Wes for a great discussion. Um, so I, I actually, I, I very much agree with the limits to arbitrage, so I think the limit here was probably a lack of knowledge that it was there. Um, and in terms of the, the, the paper and what I'm trying to get out of it is more a, a behavioral econ, you know, exploration of the bias. So that's less important to me, but it does probably make it kind of uh, less enticing for practitioners. But um, I think the, it was a great discussion. And okay. Thank you. All right, Sam. Uh, again, let's open it up for discussions and questions. Uh, we'll start by the front. My question concerns uh, the impact of the choice of the, the definition of surprise relative to the IBEST data. The, the analysts, IBEST, of course, were published prior to, remember, you have the date, prior to the announcement of, of the previous day. So, and particularly results for the same industry. If you observe a competitor within the same industry offering an earnings supplies relative to IBEST, that in itself would tell you if the analysts could probably redo the forecasts for your firm, they would raise that up. Uh, so, so therefore, it either, or if, if we're positive, so, so therefore the actual surprise number would be less than, than, yep. than, it, than it otherwise would. And I think, you, you know, you might say focus on big firms, information about the economy, but particularly your impact on the industry effects being substantially greater. Maybe you could comment on that. So absolutely, that, that's a very good question. Um, so there, there's a few different things we did to address that worry. So one is, and I, I didn't talk about the details, but when we're looking at any of the forecasts, we've cut the sample to from before firm A announces. So we've got a slightly more stale um, analyst surprise because we don't want to capture guys who update in response to firm A's announcement the previous day. Um, the second is if you don't like IBIS, and there, there are good reasons to both very much like them and, and think they're shortcomings, you can redo all of our standard tests. Instead of using the analyst forecast error, do a return-based measure. So look not at what was the surprise of large firms yesterday, but what was the valuated return in response to their own announcement that happened yesterday. Um, and, and again, you're going to find, uh, we've got it in the paper, but 
the, the, the scaling is different, but the magnitude of kind of the shift is very, very similar between those two. Would you find the same industry effects that you observed, the greater effect for the industry if you did that? Um, so truthfully, I don't remember. I, I think we've done that table, and I, I don't even know if we've done that table. So we've done kind of the, the standard baseline. The, the industry table is actually one of the newer tables in the paper, so I don't know if we've done the return measure. But we can definitely check, and hopefully it'll, it'll still be there. Okay, questions? Over here. Thank you. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, hi, good morning, thank you. Um, I was just curious if you had studied uh, any effects uh, within the earnings season, say from the beginning, the middle, and the end, and if you saw any, um, any observation in any of the differences, uh, was there any bias or any building fatigue uh, within the quarter? Uh, and then uh, the concept of the reference point kind of made me think about Tversky Economy in 91 and loss aversion. And I just wanted to know if you, so if you looked at the quarters, but then if you looked at every after the earnings season was over, if you looked at a positive quarter or a generally negative quarter um, compared to maybe a random walk quarter, uh, if there were any differences in those as well. Thank you. Uh, so those are, those are some very good questions. And we haven't, what we've done is we've controlled for those things, but I haven't actually looked at the differences. So one of the things we had, so let, let me go to your last question first. So one question is, how does this behave, say, when news is really good, generally in a quarter, or really bad? And there are quarters with, say, consistently higher earning surprises than others. The way we've dealt with that here is we basically put in kind of a, a monthly fixed effect. You can put in a quarterly fixed effect, get basically identical results, which shows that there is a, in, if you look at our regressions, there is a little bit difference in that coefficient, not huge. Um, so I haven't explicitly looked at, say, only quarters where news was generally good or bad and how it varies. One thing we have explored that, that isn't in the paper is if you look at, um, say, days where there were multiple big firms yesterday, which ones seemed to be the most attention grabbing? Two characteristics, so one was just size, so the biggest firm gets a bit more attention. The other is the biggest loss yesterday. Um, again, not, not hugely statistically different, but kind of no matter how you cut it, that seemed to have the, the bigger impact. So that, uh, my guess is that that would mean maybe when there's significantly negative news, maybe there's a bit more action. In the two parallel plots, again, it's not statistically different, but on that, the left side of that chart, you see a bit more of the action going on. Um, so I, but, we, but I haven't, say, done, I think, the table you want, which is what's this coefficient like good quarters, neutral quarters, bad quarters, um, which would be interesting to see. Roughly the same answer, earnings season. So we've done versions where we say control for where you are in the earnings season. That doesn't seem to impact the, the coefficient very much, which again is suggestive to us that it's probably somewhat consistent. But I, um, it, it would be a nice thing to do, say, look every week or two of an earnings season, see if it's consistent, if, people, if this becomes bigger, smaller, and um, again, other than controlling for it, I haven't looked at how the pattern changes, but I, I think that's an interesting thing to, to examine. Rather than surprises, as we all talk about factors, would it make sense to say the surprise at T minus one was because a merger they had done had not gone well, or the surprise was the GDP growth in the quarter was so fast that their advertising stream was good, and so was their, so could it not be one level deeper, I guess is the word, where it's factors of surprises, the why of surprises? So, yeah, so I, I would say um, we're looking at this setting because it's very clean empirically. We can rule out a lot, of, a lot of possibilities, and we also see a lot of very similar recurring events. So it's very nice as an econometrician. That doesn't mean that we don't think that, say, that this could be important in, in other settings, macro announcements, stuff like that. We think it's unlikely to be capturing a systematic kind of factor to earnings announcements because we don't see big correlations within the earnings announcements, and there's not much predictability. So if it's generally a, a factor type story, you, I, I think it would be more persistent than, say, a one day reaction to the earnings surprise yesterday. Um, so so th th I, I think that's, but we do think, say, we, we haven't explored it because it gets a lot messier and the, the number of variables you can look at increase, but say, uh, relative to macro news, relative to other news, what are there contrast effects uh, along those lines? Uh, yeah? 
Um, I'm wondering if you looked at, or and if you did, if uh, what the results were, if the earnings releases were not consistent in their surprise. So, for example, um, it was a positive earnings surprise, but negative on revenues, or a positive earnings surprise, but a guide down on future guidance versus um, analysts. And if there was, if you considered that noise, and if so, what was the result? So we, we have not looked at all of that variables. The short answer, we're looking at just earnings per share, um, which is, you know, I, I think the, the most widely reported, but there's a lot more information that comes out in these earnings calls that have been shown to be important in a, in a variety of ways. Um, it would be interesting, so, so I, I think it would be a cool test to say, look at, I don't know, five components of earnings and say, if all signals were pointing in the same way, exactly, right. would there be a stronger contrast? We, so we have not done that, but I, I think that would be an interesting thing, thing to look at. And please be sure to um, announce your name, Mr. Coffey. Oh, sure, right. It's a very interesting topic. What, uh, in so similar lines as some of the other people that have highlighted about uh, some of the the other factors that we can kind of add to the current model. I was wondering if you, like if you're looking at company A and company B, did you look at some of the like individual attributes, like how volatile company A is relative to company B, and what are the S&P ratings? Are they both double A versus double uh, A and triple B? And have you also tried to see how the options market, because these are very liquid names that you're trying to see, so does the option market move a lot during that time? And if you have to enter, what is your exit time to kind of uh, close the strategy? If you want to close it within two days, or are you going to decay the whole strategy within that time frame? So the, the extent we've looked at similarity has really just been industry, and clearly there's a lot of other dimensions. The important thing um, you know, for there to be a contrast effect has to be lots of people are looking at the same sequence of events kind of in, in the same sequence. So that's why um, we really focus on size. We think that's the most plausible story. We think industry is pretty good. Um, you know, things like volatility, my, I, 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 you guys probably know better than I do, truthfully, in terms of how many people say track companies based on, on volatility or something like that. We, we haven't looked as the, the short answer. Um, so in terms of, so, sorry, you had that, and then there was something about time. So it, it, we aren't necessarily presenting our, our trading strategy to say this is a great opportunity. This is you know, very fast in and out of the market. Um, I, truthfully, I, I don't know if it's realistically plausible. What I can say is before you take into account the, the trading costs, the, anything along those lines, it's very important if you actually want to implement it. For me as an academic, I, I think the magnitudes and the fact that it's there is quite compelling. Now this could also be another kind of limit to arbitrage uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, Wes's concerns. I think, did you have a middle question that I missed? Or, uh, One other question just popped my mind is like, how sensitive are they to cycles of the economy? Like, are Cycle. stocks more receptive during a downward phase where a small negative surprise really hurts the sentiments more than on an upward trajectory? Yeah, so this is kind of related to the, the question about like good quarters versus bad quarters. So most of the regressions had some time fixed effects, which basically kind of demeans the variables and, and takes, takes it that into account. But I, d I haven't looked explicitly in how it's different in the good times and the bad times. But I can tell you that once you control for that, you see the effect. But that, that tells you the mean effect. It doesn't tell you the heterogeneity across those different regimes, um, which I could, I could split the sample and look at that. I, I, j I just don't know the answer. Uh, yeah? Hi, my name is Sandeep Tyagi. So uh, my question is, and you may have it in there, but I can't uh, untangle it real time. If you were to look at the, let's just say, two announcements, so two companies, one on T minus one, one on T, uh, and combine somehow the combined surprise of the two companies and look at the combined price movement of the two companies over two days, mm -hmm. what do you expect to find? Do you, would you see the same impact of the combined earning surprise on the combined company which would mean that the sequence of information was not important versus what you seem to be referring to, that sequence of information is important, that if there is a big surprise on the first day, then the net result on both companies together after two days would be different. 
Yeah, so that, that I, I went through it quickly, but I have that one table with a bunch of interactions that I think gets to your question. So one story is the simple contrast effect story of, you know, there was really good news yesterday. There's kind of a parallel shift in how I view it today. Everything's a bit worse. Another story is an interaction. There's good news yesterday. That means that good news today gets viewed in a certain way and bad news gets viewed in a certain way and it's based on an interaction between those two announcements. Um, and there are scenarios in psychology where you'll get some action like that. It's not quite a contrast effect. But when we looked at the data, there doesn't seem to be much evidence of that interaction. So we, we tried kind of cutting it a whole bunch of different ways. You can kind of interact surprise yesterday and today. You can look at surprise yesterday based on, on bins of surprise today. Um, and we don't see a, a whole bunch of evidence for an interactive effect, but it, it is noisier. So we, we think that what we're capturing is, is the cleanest one, but it doesn't rule out the possibility of, of such a story. Uh, I guess way in the back. Um, have you looked at the impact on the option markets and like the impact on the skew, both on the puts and the calls? Yes, yeah, so that was your middle question that I forgot. Um, so very good question. Um, so the short answer is no. I, I haven't looked at, at options at all. Um, I, I'd be interested in, in, in looking at them, but um, the, the, this is uh, already getting to be a longish paper, so maybe the next paper I'll, I'll, I'll check out the options. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. My name is Mikhail Samanov. Do these results hold up internationally, A, and part B on macroeconomic announcements? Yeah. Thank you. So, so uh, internationally, I don't know. Um, I, I also am, in, again, you guys probably know better than I do. I don't know, like in the US, it seems like EPS is kind of the, the, the number that gets announced. I don't know internationally if that is the number, if there's variation there. Um, but so the, the short answer is I, I don't know internationally. Um, for macro announcements, I think it'd be a good thing to look at. The, and I've, I've thought a little bit about it. I haven't run any tests. The, the question that I've got the, that I've got there is, so there's lots of macro announcements, but clearly there's some that are really important and some that no one pays as much attention to. So getting the, you know, which one are the, real, the, the really important ones? And then the, the, num the, the problem is that N decreases dramatically when you look at kind of time series. So since we're looking at individual stocks, we have a lot more power. And so the, the other issue there is just getting, you know, even if you're looking at 30 years of macro announcements um, that are a few times, you know, a month or something like that, the number of observations you have are going to be a lot lower. And you're looking at things there like, say, market reactions, um, which are, are going to be, be harder to. Um, but I, I think that it's, I haven't come up with a clever way to kind of get over those issues, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, and you'd expect there to be similar behavior there.